got a lot of things that we want to do, a lot of places we would like to go, a lot of things we would like to experience, and we just stop at but, and we build a case. In fact, I was reading something the other day that, that talked about but. It says but is an argument for our limitations, and when we argue for our limitations, we get to keep them. See, but will cause you to procrastinate, but will cause you to hide out behind fear, but will cause you to come up with all type of excuses that you can validate your inaction and not acting on your dream. And right now, more than ever, people need to look for ways to live their dream. People need, need to look for ways to make it on their own. There is no such thing as job security. There's no such thing as a storm-proof or tragic-proof life. There are no guarantees today, ladies and gentlemen. The illusion is gone. There was a time when, when we graduated from high school, you were told, go to college and get out, and you go and work for a corporation for 30 or 40 years, they give you a gold watch and you'll retire. Special announcement, that day is gone. <laughs> that day is gone, never to return again. So instead of people living in fear, feeling stressed out, feeling powerless, feeling like victims, I think it should be a time that we need to begin to look at ways that we can become an active force in our own lives. Look at ways when we can decide to take charge of our own destiny. Look at ways when we can decide to design a life of substance and begin to truly live our dreams. And it's time for people to decide, I'm ready to get on with my life. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left. A guy named Bob May say this, say, don't let nobody turn you around. Do that right quick. <laughs> now, you know, a lot of people say, I'm going to live my life one day when things get right, when I get all my bills paid, when I get my feet on the ground, I say, what have you been walking on? <laughs> See, there are no problem-free moments. A guy named Dimples had a record one time called, if it ain't one thing, it's another. And I say, if it ain't one thing, it's 12 others. Always something there. To build a case on why you can't move on, why you can't grow to the next level, why you can't begin to manifest your greatness, why you can't begin to live life on your terms. Always something there to block you, to keep you where you are, and keep you from beginning to develop your true greatness. Always some fear. How do we handle it? And I'm saying that if you've been hiding out behind but, if you've been using the fact that you don't have enough money or you don't have the education, take it head on. Go get the education. I was saying to a guy the other day who was saying, he, he, I said, how old are you? He says, 47 years old. I said, your sister tell me that you can't read. He said, that's right. I said, why? Well, you know, I, I, I didn't go to school. I said, Excuse me, how old are you? I'm 47. 47? Yes. And you can't read or write? Yes. Have you ever heard of adult school, adult education? Have, have you decided that you should learn how to read to begin to expand your world. Why are you using that as a racket? Why don't you decide now that you're going to expand your world, that if other people can learn, you could learn too? Well, it's hard for me. How do you, have you been and sit in a class yet? Have you signed up yet? No, I haven't. See, a lot of people say no, ladies and gentlemen, to things, and they don't even know what they're saying no to. He have not even challenged himself. He hasn't even gone to sit into a class and say, teach me how to read. Instead, it's been easier for him to go through life, he thinks, trying to play a whole con game, pretending he knows how to do something that he doesn't know how to do. And you know what? Most of us go through life like that. Most of us go through life pretending pretending that we're satisfied where we are, pretending that everything is okay, pretending that, that we don't have any special goals or ambitions or desires, when really deep down inside we do really want more. But if you look at our behavior, if you judge based upon what we do, that really will tell you some true stories about people, because you have to judge a tree by the fruit it bears, not the fruit that it talks about. See, a lot of people pretend that they want more out of life, but all you have to do is watch their actions. That will tell you something. So I used to pretend that I wanted to lose weight, but how could you tell I was pretending? Watch me when I have a piece of sweet potato pie. <laughs>
Let me get within walking distance of some peanuts. <laughs> some potato chips. See, I was pretending that I really wanted to lose weight. No, you just watch what I eat. I'll tell you what I'm seriously committed to. People tell you, oh yeah, one day I want to have a restaurant. See, they're pretending they want to go into business for themselves. They're not serious. How can you tell less? Watch their actions. Watch what they're doing. The proof is in the pudding. So if you want to do something, if you thought about something you want to do, take it head on. Decide that you're going to start looking at it, start doing research on it, start tackling it, start becoming involved in whatever and wherever it might lead you to begin to explore the possibilities in that particular thing that you're seeking so that you can begin to learn all you can about it. Decide that you're going to face it, that whatever shortcomings you have, that you're going to strengthen yourself there. Whatever training that's required, that you're going to go get that training. But you're going to get started right now. And George Washington Carver would say, do what you can, where you are with what you have, and never be satisfied. S.B. Fuller used to say, and I heard Joe Dudley talk about, always strive to be more than that which you are. Yeah, don't get satisfied with yourself. Always know that wherever you are, you can enjoy more, that you deserve more. But most people, you know what they do? Most people go through life quietly and safely, tiptoeing to an early grade. Find out what it is you want and go after it as if your life depends on it. Why? Because it does. People that have found their passion, people that found the things that they love, people that have found the things that they can pour their lives into, those people live longer. I was in New York and I had to do a seminar at a special church and a guy by the name of Reverend Johnny Youngblood. And I said, how is it that you were able to build this big housing facility and got all of the various community and religious groups together to, to have this dwelling for 2,000 residents that were, were once homeless? How were you able to take on this responsibility? Wasn't it overwhelming? He said, the kind of work I do, he said, it's in me. I've got to live what's in me. And I think that's everybody's desire in life. You've got to live what's in you. Life is just too short and unpredictable. But what, are, what do we say? But, but there always be tomorrow. Oh, no. There are no guarantees you're going to show up tomorrow. There are a lot of people who were here yesterday that they're not here today. There are a lot of opportunities that were around yesterday. They're not here today. Oh, you can wait, but you know what Abraham Lincoln said? Well, good things might come to those who, to, who wait, but only the things that have been left over by those who hustle. So who want to go through life picking up leftovers? You deserve much more than that. The leftovers is somebody has left you. So take it head on, begin to explore it. Here's something else. Decide to do it now. Decide whatever you want to do that you are now going to become actively involved right now exploring the possibilities for you. That you're going to look at it and do just a little bit of it right now. When I decided to become a speaker, I didn't just quit my job and just ran out and say, I'm a motivational speaker. No. What I did was I decided to start looking at other people that were involved in the speaking profession. I volunteered to work with some speakers so that I could learn. Whatever you want to do, get your feet wet. Gain some experience doing some volunteer work in the area and find out whether or not this thing you want to do will fit for you. A friend of mine told me he wanted to have a restaurant. I said, have you ever operated a restaurant before? He said, no. I said, well, really, you don't even know if you want one. I said, what's your expertise? What do you bring to the table? He said, I can cook real good. I said, well, what about the management side? What about the business part of the restaurant? You're not going to be cooking all the time. Somebody's got to receive the money. Who's going to manage the personnel? He said, you got a right. You got a point there. So this guy got a job in a restaurant in the evening time on a part-time basis. After doing that for a while, he said, you know what? I think I just want to be a chef. <laughs> he said, after working there, people didn't show up to work. He, he said, it's hard to find the help. People weren't responsible, the headaches, the guests were just giving him problems day in and day out. They weren't ever satisfied. He said, no, I just think I'll stick to cooking. <laughs> See, you got to find out what fits for you. Because you might decide that after you go up in there and examine it and experience it and, and get some experience under your belt on it, well, you say, this is really not what I want. This does not fit for me. So decide that you're going to do that. Now, John H. Johnson said something that's very important. He said, there's no defense against an excellence that meets a pressing public need. See, whatever you decide to do, look at it and find out what is it that I have that I could bring to the table 
that can begin to enable me to ensure that I could be successful in this. Where is the opening for you? There's room for you out here. Out here in the arena call life, there's room for you to come out and live your dream. Don't allow but to keep you in the corner or keep you up in the bleachers looking at life being a spectator, not being a participant, making a difference in life. I believe that all of us came here with something. All of us showed up to give something and that nobody, but nobody's going to give that service that you have to give. No one's going to produce your product. No one's going to write your book. No one's going to open your academy. No one's going to begin to create your daycare with a special curriculum to help to cultivate the high self-esteem in our children. That's your idea. And if you don't bring your idea out here when you die, all of us will suffer because we've been deprived of your genius because you allowed butt to keep you in the bleachers and not pursuing your greatness. You take it to your grave with you. And that's what most people do. I think that's why the guy said that many people die at age 21 and don't get buried until they're 65. They're walking dead. You can tell them by the way they walk. <laughs> How they look in the face. When they speak to you. I was giving a speech at this high school and a lady came after school. She said, Mr. Brown, I want to talk to you about my son. I said, what is it? She said, he's not motivated. I said, I wonder why got to have energy ladies and gentlemen you got to have life if you're excited about what you're doing even in the area of selling you know people don't buy because of logical reasoning people buy because of your way of feeling people don't like to be around dead people <laughs> no no let the dead bury the dead no no keep them away from you before they grab you run a whole load to you or something. <laughs> so the fact that that whatever you do you want to be excited about it you want to have the kind of excitement that is so contagious that people want to be around you. Because whatever you're doing, whatever you talk to people about this particular idea that you have, they're looking at you and they want to know, do you believe it? And are you the kind of person they want to be in business with? And if you're not positive, if you're not energetic, if you're not fired up about it, how can you expect anybody else to be fired up about your idea? Am I right? All right, re repeat after me, please. I'm going to be fired up about my dream. I'm going to go at it with everything I got. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got what it takes. There are a lot of people who say, but I tried once or twice and it didn't work out. And so they use that as an excuse not to ever come out again. Guy said, um, if at first you don't succeed, you're running about average. <laughs> so, so, so if you have come out here with an idea and it didn't work out two or three times, well, that's all right. You're running about average. You know, I heard something, a, a, a jarring question. It says, why is it that people prefer known hells to unknown heavens? You know why? Because it's comfortable, ladies and gentlemen. I remember I was in um, a service once, and I heard Dr. Johnny Coleman give this example. She talked about a man who had been captured behind the enemy lines in a war and was sentenced to, to be killed or another option. The captain said to the guy, listen, he said, tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, you can face the firing squad or... You can go out this door over here. And the guy said, what's out the door? He said, no one knows. All we can tell you is just unknown horrors. He thought, and the next morning he selected the firing squad. After the shots rang out, the captain's secretary said, what's beyond that door? And he said, freedom. But very few people select to do it because it's unknown see a lot of people never live their dreams a lot of people never do the things they want to do a lot of people stay on jobs where they're miserable I read an article called is your job making you sick a lot of people some of y'all know about that already here <laughs> so they're going to say amen it's all right <laughs> 
That one lady told me, she said, Les, I, when I used to go to work, she said, when I stepped in the door, it felt like a refrigerator dropped on my shoulders. How many of y'all understand that kind of feeling? They were miserable, just hated to go after 60 minutes on Sunday afternoon. Or come Monday morning, my head used to throb. I just couldn't take it. Didn't want to go sometimes just, just for the heck of it. I just drive on by. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, I, I used to hate to go to work. Many of us choose an active living death. Many of us are walking dead. The walking dead. That we're not doing what we want to do. Many of us stay in relationships where we're dying together rather than growing and expanding and living together. We're miserable, but because we don't have the courage to see ourselves beyond that relationship that is turned toxic, we go through life living dead people. And you can always tell couples that have been together for a little while. <laughs> go in a restaurant, the one sitting side by side, giggling and talking to each other feed each other with their fork and spoon, they just got together for one week. <laughs> you see them in the car, they're sitting all up for each other, hugging and smoking. Oh, they've been together about three days, all right? <laughs> but if you see people sitting in the restaurant, two people, you know, see a couple, and they're sitting in front of each other. <laughs> Takes so long for this food, I wonder when they go hurry up. Those are the married ones. <laughs> But what if I know people have been married for years, living in two separate rooms, sleeping in two separate beds? Well, it's cheaper to keep it. Not necessarily. <laughs> it's according to the price you want to pay. See, the price of peace of mind, the price of living the truth, of being honest with yourself and say, wait a minute, there's got to be more than this. So you've got to decide, wait, wait. Even if I... I, things don't work out, even if I experience defeat or failure, that does not make me a failure. It's a difference between failing and being a failure. If, you, if things don't work out, if you don't produce the results you want, that's all. But don't confuse who you are with the results that you produce. I used to be a state legislator in Columbus, Ohio. And I remember once I was going to introduce some legislation on the floor, and after getting that legislation passed, um, a guy came up behind me, and he had some legislation that I opposed him on that. And I was about to stand up to debate this guy, and the guy next to me said, excuse me, don't, don't debate that guy. Why? Do you know who that is? I said, no. That's Will Konsky from Toledo. That's a bad dude. He's a lawyer, Les. That man can debate. I don't care. I'm Les Brown. Maybe Brown's ball. <laughs> So I raised my hand, Mr. Speaker, he said, the gentleman from the 29th House District? He said, yes, sir. So tell the gentleman I'd like to take him on. Challenge him on this legislation. He said, Wilkowski said, I would more than like to, Mr. Speaker. Everybody would say, whoa. <laughs> I asked him some questions. He responded. I said, I wonder why I asked that man that question. <laughs> <laughs> Wilkowski won't be out. I mean, I was so embarrassed, I just limped back to my room with my yes, I can attitude. <laughs> However, here's what I learned. When you win, see, if I win a debate, I win because of what I know. When I lose, I lose because what I don't know. So I had to check out what is it that I did not know. I wasn't prepared. I did not do enough research. I did not do my homework. So he handled me like he wanted to. So I came back again. I waited on some other legislation, did my whole work, but he was more than able to take me out again. But pretty soon, each time it would take him, it would become a little bit more difficult and a little bit more difficult. And the older guy said, would you argue in behalf of this legislation for me? I said, sure. I started volunteering to do work in the legislative committees for the older guys. I said, absolutely. And the more I did it, the better I became. And then people began to start respecting me. And when I would ask and say, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to speak on that bill. Some guys' lips start trembling and stuff, like Jimmy. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Is there anything wrong? Do we have a problem?